Stepping into the glittering world of Hollywood's golden age, there's one name that no one can ever forget, Ken Curtis. With a career that spanned an incredible six decades, Curtis became an absolute legend in the biz, leaving an unforgettable mark on music, film, and television. But this cowboy, known for his talent in westerns, was also marked with a life of tragedy and suffering that eventually led to his untimely demise. Join us as we explore Ken Curtis's daughter, confirming the rumors about his private life. Early Life Curtis Wayne Gates was born on July 2, 1916, in the scenic setting of southeastern Colorado. Growing up on the Muddy Creek Ranch in eastern Bent County, he soaked in the essence of the land before his family packed up and moved to Los Angeles. His dad being sheriff there laid down the groundwork for Ken's strong sense of duty and honor. Ken grew up with his twin brother, Chester Curtis, and their older brother, Carl Gates, on a ranch in Lamar. But in 1926, they made the move to Los Animas, Colorado, so their dad, Dan Sullivan Gates, could run for sheriff. At the same time, their mom, Nellie Sneed Gates, kept the home fires burning. In high school, Curtis was quite the all-rounder. He led his football team as quarterback and wowed audiences with his clarinet skills in the school band. Graduating in 1935, he stood on the brink of a future where his many talents would shine. But duty called when World War II came knocking, and he served with courage and dedication in the United States Army from 1943 to 1945. Once he was back from serving in the war, though, Curtis knew he wanted to pursue his passions in life, and it all began with music. Falling in love with music. Curtis was all about staying true to something bigger than himself, even though he had a bright future lined up in medicine at Colorado College. But fate had its own ideas. It gently pushed him away from medical education and towards the music scene, where his true passion was just waiting to hit the high notes. Ken Curtis, a real heavyweight in both the music and movie biz, was all about growth and versatility. He effortlessly juggled roles as a singer and an actor, his journey into the big league started with a jaw-dropping display of vocal chops. At this point, Curtis's talents weren't so extraordinary that many influential people in the industry began noticing him. Then came the time when his talent and hard work earned him a spot with the legendary Tommy Dorsey band in 1941. This was a great deal for Ken. He wasn't only joining a great band that was known worldwide for its tunes, but he was also stepping into the shoes once filled by none other than the great Frank Sinatra. You could say things had begun going quite smoothly for the singer, but once again life threw a curveball when contracts shuffled the deck and Dick Hames took over for Sinatra. Ken went from potentially making it big right under the spotlight to becoming a sort of backup plan in the wings. Yet it was during this period of musical chairs that Curtis underwent a bit of a makeover. He ditched his old moniker to come out fresh as Ken Curtis, and this signaled the start of a whole new chapter in his journey. Digging deeper into the music scene, Curtis found himself jamming with Shep Fields and his new music crew. This was a bunch that fused traditional brass with a modern twist. These guys ended up expanding Curtis's musical horizons in all sorts of cool ways. This shift wasn't just a career move for Curtis, though. It shifted his path and interests in music completely. The change showed his willingness to roll with the punches and explore fresh territory in the ever-changing world of showbiz. By embracing change and collaborating with boundary-pushing artists, Curtis kept on carving out his own unique niche in the game. Amidst all the hustle and bustle of chasing his musical dreams, fate played its hand and brought Curtis and Lorraine Page together. Their connection was pretty much rooted in their ties to Universal Studios. Soon, what seemed like a beautiful friendship blossomed into marriage in 1943. Curtis found his groove in the lively world of radio, where his rich, velvety voice found a cozy spot on the airwaves. He became a big deal as both a singer and host on the prestigious country music program, The Wheeling Jamboree. There was no doubt Curtis brought a charm that was very rare in the industry. As soon as he hopped on the radio, he was able to capture the hearts of the audiences left and right with his musical charisma. Everything was going good for Curtis, and then came the year, 1948. This was a time that really turned the dial for Curtis. 
It was during this period that his stint with the iconic Sons of the Pioneers hit its peak. From 1949 to 1953, and then again from 1952 to 1957, Curtis took center stage as the lead singer of this legendary group, leaving an unforgettable mark with hits like Room Full of Roses and the spine-tingling Ghost Riders in the Sky. Now, Ken was flying sky-high in the music industry, but as he was exploring this creative side of him, there was another part that was buzzing with talent, and that was his love for acting, jumping into westerns. Curtis's whirlwind journey through the world of cinema was one of a kind. His legacy shines with a whole bunch of diverse roles. The actor was able to transport audiences to captivating landscapes of musical westerns and also timeless collaborations with Hollywood greats. His partnership with Columbia Pictures especially, which kicked off in 1945, brought many opportunities to his doorstep. In the end, Curtis was able to make his mark in the golden era of Hollywood. Teaming up with the acclaimed Hoosier Hotshots, Curtis hit the silver screen as the ultimate singing cowboy. He played swoon-worthy romantic leads that stole hearts and echoed across the vast landscapes of the Wild West. But the real plot twist in Curtis's story came with his second trip down the aisle, with Barbara Ford, which not only changed his personal life, but also elevated his professional status. Back in 1958, there was pure joy in the Ford household as Barbara was expecting a bundle of joy. They were over the moon, considering adoption before this amazing news. But tragically, they faced heartbreak when Barbara suffered a miscarriage, leaving them unable to have children. Despite the ups and downs, Barbara and Curtis shared many happy years together. But their love story eventually took a turn, and they parted ways in 1964. The good thing is that in his second marriage, Ken Curtis found himself connected to none other than the legendary film director John Ford. Of course, as Curtis became Ford's son-in-law, it definitely came with its perks. One of the coolest collabs was in the flick Rio Grande, where Curtis joined forces with Ford and the iconic John Wayne. Now in the movie, Curtis wasn't just playing a regular role. He was part of the fictional band, The Regimental Singers. But here's the thing. The band actually consisted of the Sons of the Pioneers. While Curtis didn't snag a spot in the main cast, though, he still left his mark, especially with memorable roles like Charlie McCory in The Searchers alongside John Wayne. But that's not all. Curtis had quite the impressive resume because of his roles in many other genres, too. Curtis dives deep into cinema. From classics like The Quiet Man to The Horse Soldiers and The Alamo, he was a familiar face on the silver screen. Let's also not forget his hilarious turn in the Navy comedy Mr. Roberts, where he shared the screen with quite the talented crew like Henry Fonda and James Cagney. The more the actor was exposed to various kinds of film in this era, the more influential actors wanted to work with him. The result was that as soon as the actor finished playing one role in a movie, he was whisked away to another role soon after. You could say, Curtis was living out his prime years with the busiest schedules ever, and he was loving every bit of it. Now, Curtis wasn't just an actor, though. He dipped his toes into producing, too. In 1959, he dabbled in the world of low-budget monster flicks and brought us gems like the Killer Shrews and the Giant Gila Monster. This was definitely quite the turn from the kind of westerns the actor was known to be involved in. And if that wasn't enough, he even starred opposite Sam Elliott in Conagher, a film based on the works of the legendary Louis L'Amour. In showbiz, Curtis may have started out with westerns, but he wasn't just limited to the wild frontier. His cinematic journey took him far and wide, even into the realms of comedy gold. Take Mr. Roberts, for example, where he shared the screen with famous people like Henry Fonda, James Cagney, William Powell, and Jack Lemmon. That was certainly one incredible way of making a mark beyond the tumbleweeds and saloons of the Old West. Curtis's impact kept on unfolding in a trio of flicks brought to you by Cornelius Vanderbilt Whitney Pictures, where he left his mark in a big way. First off, there's the timeless gem The Searchers, where his presence added depth to the vast Western scenery. Then there's the heartwarming The Missouri Traveler, where he shared the screen with Brandon DeWilde and Lee Marvin. And finally, the gripping drama The Young Land, 
where he teamed up with Patrick Wayne and Dennis Hopper. What is interesting here is that Curtis wasn't always acting as the main lead or the one of the main characters in every movie. But even in roles that might have slipped under the radar, the actor's charisma still shone through. One good example is his role in Five Steps to Danger, where he played Federal Bureau of Investigation agent Jim Anderson, even though he didn't get top billing. His portrayal injected a whole new layer of complexity into the storyline and showed off his skills way beyond the glare of the spotlight. Not content with just acting, Curtis dipped his toes into the production game, steering the ship for two cult classic low-budget monster flicks in 1959, The Killer Shrews and The Giant Gila Monster. But let's not forget Curtis's impact on the small screen. His magnetic presence didn't just light up movie theaters, it echoed across television screens, leaving an unforgettable mark on a whole bunch of iconic Western and adventure series. Take Have Gun, Will Travel, for example. Curtis made recurring appearances on this top-notch Western series alongside Richard Boone and snagged guest spots a whopping five times. Then in 1959, his portrayal of cowhand Phil Jakes on Gunsmoke, especially in the fourth season episode Jayhawkers, solidified his rep as a jack-of-all-trades actor. It was clear, no matter what he did, he would always effortlessly slip into diverse roles within the Western genre. But Curtis didn't stop there. Nope. He went beyond the dusty trails of the Wild West and landed a spot on the courtroom drama Perry Mason. Viewers couldn't get enough of his portrayal of circus performer Tim Durant in the episode The Case of the Clumsy Clown, which aired in November 1960. Apart from this, there was also Ripcord, a high-flying, action-packed series that had viewers on the edge of their seats from 1961 to 1963. Here, Curtis appears in a whopping 76 thrilling episodes. Curtis's portrayal of James Jim Buckley, alongside Larry Pinnell's Theodore Ted McKeever, wasn't just about entertaining audiences. It also sparked a whole lot of interest and excitement in the world of sports parachuting. His knack for Western roles found another outlet in the syndicated television series, Death Valley Days. In 1964, his appearance as the M.U. Skinner Gren in the episode, Graydon's Charge, showed off his ability to command the screen, even in shorter guest roles. And hey, when you're sharing the stage with heavyweights like Denver Pyle and Kathy Lewis, that's saying something. Eventually, all the paths in Ken's life brought him to the role that he is known for the most today. Curtis makes history with Gunsmoke. You could say Curtis's most iconic role was Festus Hagen in Gunsmoke. He embodied a character whose gruff exterior hit a heart of gold. Joining the regular cast in 1964, Curtis slid right into Festus's scruffy, illiterate, yet charmingly bad-tempered shoes. The actor actually took over from the beloved Chester Good, played by Dennis Weaver. Now many people were a bit skeptical of this change. Sure, Curtis had made his mark as one of the most talented people in the industry, but Dennis Weaver was also considered the man who embodied his role perfectly. When it came to the Wild West on television, Marshal Matt Dillon, played by James Arness, had his trusty sidekick Chester by his side. But you know, every cowboy's got to ride off into the sunset sometime. Dennis Weaver, the actor behind Chester, felt like he had taken the character as far as he could. So he decided to mosey on out of the Western series to try his luck in different kinds of roles. That left the folks behind the scenes scratching their heads and wondering how to fill the gap left by Chester's departure. Then came Ken Curtis, riding into Gunsmoke as Festus during its eighth season. Turns out, he was the perfect fit to step into Chester's boots as Matt's loyal buddy. Plus, he brought a whole new dynamic to bounce off Milburn Stone's Doc Adams. Ken stuck around until Columbia Broadcasting System decided to hang up their spurs and cancel the show in 1975, wrapping up its 20th season. But here's the thing. The cast didn't see it coming any more than the fans did. They were just as shocked as everyone else when they heard there wouldn't be a season 21. According to MeTV, an article from the 1971 Daily Advertiser featured an interview with Ken Curtis about his role as Festus on Gunsmoke. The actor initially had doubts about stepping into the big shoes left behind by Dennis Weaver, who had portrayed Chester on the show. Both the character and the actor had left an indelible mark on the series. 
So Curtis felt like he might not measure up as a replacement. But Curtis's perspective started to shift after he starred in Season 13, Episode 7, titled Hard Luck Henry. This particular episode showcased Festus in a way that Curtis hadn't anticipated. He began to realize that Festus brought something unique to the show, different from what Chester had offered. In fact, Curtis believed that Festus had the potential to carry an entire episode on his own, something he didn't think Chester could do. According to Curtis, playing Festus brought him a certain level of comfort because he saw parallels between Festus and Monk, a character he had portrayed on Have Gun Will Travel. Interestingly, Curtis drew inspiration for both characters from a real-life figure named Cedar Jack. This was a local from his youth who worked cutting down cedar trees for fence posts. People were shocked to know that Festus Hagen wasn't just some made-up character for the screen, but that he had roots in real life, and he was inspired by a figure from Curtis's own childhood in Los Angeles. Curtis drew on memories of Cedar Jack to shape Festus's character and gave him that distinct nasal, twangy, rural accent, which was quite different from Curtis's own voice. So, in the end, Curtis wasn't just acting brilliantly in Gunsmoke. He took a piece of his past and molded it into this persona that really struck a chord with audiences all over the world. At the same time, Gunsmoke sure knew how to make the most of Ken Curtis and his character Festus during its run. But when the show unexpectedly got the boot, Curtis had to rustle up some other gigs. Unfortunately, none of them quite matched the fame and popularity he enjoyed during his time on the Western series. Now, when Columbia Broadcasting System decided to ride back into Dodge City with five made-for-TV movies, they hoped to bring back that old gunsmoke magic. But when they were setting everything up, Curtis and the network didn't see eye to eye, especially when it came to the paycheck. So he decided to hang up his hat and not reprise his role as Festus. But you know how it goes in the industry. The show must go on. Columbia Broadcasting System wasted no time filling that void, and Buck Taylor's character Newly O'Brien stepped up to the plate, fitting right in with the rest of the gang. On top of the regular personal appearances that most TV stars do to hype up their shows, Curtis took it a step further. When Gunsmoke wasn't in production, he hit the road and traveled all over the country to put on Western-themed stage shows at fairs, rodeos, and other venues. He even kept up these gigs for a few years even after the show ended. If there was one man who was dedicated to keeping the Wild West spirit alive, it was clearly Ken. But even Curtis realized he wanted to broaden his horizons at some point. Ken's brilliant roles in other genres. And let's not forget Curtis's versatility. Fate brought him together with Carol O'Connor, who guest starred in a couple of Gunsmoke episodes. Fast forward a few years, and Curtis returned the favor by appearing as a retired police detective on O'Connor's National Broadcasting Company show, In the Heat of the Night, proving he could adapt to any television landscape with ease. And hey, he even dipped his toe into the world of animation. Now, at that time, the animation world was quite different than what we see today. Disney was one of the very few corporations that was known for bringing the world to life through animation, and they were considered quite the big deal in those days when they started out. So when Curtis was dabbling in various roles in acting, he also caught the attention of Disney. But for his voice, Curtis lent his voice to the character Nutsy the Vulture in Disney's beloved 1973 film Robin Hood. This was a huge deal considering this version of Robin Hood is considered one of the most classic ones out there today. Ken continued to be a part of iconic roles like these. Then, a decade after saying goodbye to Gunsmoke, Curtis made a triumphant comeback to television in the short-lived but impactful Western series, The Yellow Rose. Teaming up with Noah Beery Jr., he once again proved his magnetism and ability to keep audiences hooked. By this time, Ken Curtis had officially left his mark on the Western scene. In 1981, he was inducted into the Western Performers Hall of Fame at the swanky National Cowboy and Western Heritage Museum. It was like a shining trophy for all the hard work he'd put into embodying the spirit of the Wild West. Ken's talent and dedication earned him serious street cred among the Western greats, and it marked his place as a legend in the game. His final acting role as the weathered cattle rancher Senor T 
in the television production Kagaro in 1991 was a poignant swan song to his career. Based on the work of Western literary giant Louis Lemour, the project brought Curtis full circle. Sharing the screen with Sam Elliott, Curtis reunited with his Gunsmoke co-star Buck Taylor, who took on a villainous role in the same film. The familial connection didn't stop there. Buck Taylor's father, Dub Taylor, also secured a minor role, infusing the production with a rich legacy of talent and camaraderie. It was a fitting finale for a man whose legacy will forever live on in the annals of Western lore. As far as Ken's filming career was concerned, he was doing wonders. But Curtis's personal life was a roller coaster ride, all mixed up and full of surprises. Curtis's health problems catch up to him. The actor's rock-solid marriage to Tori Connolly was the backbone of it all, and it lasted until he bid farewell in 1991. But it wasn't just a regular old marriage. Through Tori, he became a step-parent and was also able to form bonds that went deeper than just sharing DNA. But that doesn't mean that it was all smooth sailing for Curtis when it came to his third wife. Their relationship was full of drama, twists, and turns. And then there's the stress of his demanding career. According to Ken's daughter, the actor came to a point where he couldn't cope with the stress of his job. So to cope, Curtis turned to tobacco, thinking it was no big deal. But soon he'd realize he was completely wrong. That little habit ended up wreaking havoc on his health, especially his heart. Within the first five years of tying the knot with Tor, Curtis went through a major health wake-up call. It was like a light bulb moment, but not the good kind. He found himself stuck in a downward spiral he couldn't shake. Fast forward to the late 1960s, and Tori discovered the ugly truth. Curtis had cancer, and it was serious. This hit Tori like nothing else ever had in her life. Not only was she going to lose the man she wanted to spend the rest of her life with, but their dreams of starting a family together also shattered like glass. As Ken Curtis battled his illness, he couldn't hide the pain anymore. So he and Tori decided to roll with the punches and let fate take its course. Despite all the tough times, they did something really special. They adopted two awesome kids. It was their way of saying they weren't going to let this illness beat them. But as Curtis dealt with his health issues, he found some solace in puffing on cigarettes. Atherosclerosis, a real stubborn condition, was weighing heavy on his heart, making him have to think hard about his health choices. Tori, who used to be by his side through thick and thin, suddenly found herself playing the role of caregiver. She even watched him struggle with fatigue and tried to keep up with all the bills. It was definitely not easy, and Tori began losing a part of herself too, as the years went by. In his final months, Curtis finally opened up about the dark clouds of depression hanging over him. He was desperate to keep his smoking habit under wraps, so he started avoiding crowded places to dodge any judgment. But as the truth started coming out, Tori bravely shared their untold stories and gave everyone a real glimpse into the tough times they faced and how they managed to stay strong through it all. Apart from being Ken Curtis's right-hand gal for a good 30 years, Tori was also the heart and soul of the professional rodeo cowboys community for a solid two decades before that. You couldn't miss her if you tried. Her obituary painted her as the kind of person who could turn a total stranger into a buddy in no time flat. Many of Ken's friends were glad someone like Tori was there to look out for him, especially in his final years. It was clear the actor was going through a lot physically and mentally, and Tori did her best to be there for him in every way possible. Even in Tori's obituary, it was written that she had this knack for making everyone feel like they'd known her forever. That's the kind of warm, welcoming spirit she brought to the table. That is also the warmth that Curtis experienced up until his death. Final Years In his later years, Curtis found a comforting home in Clovis, a place that welcomed him with open arms and where his legacy lives on, far away from the glitz and glamour of Hollywood. Curtis wasn't just about lights, camera, action. He had strong political convictions, too. He was a staunch supporter of the Republican Party, and he threw his weight behind Barry Goldwater during the big 1964 United States presidential election. His dedication to his beliefs added another layer to his already complex personality, and it shows that his influence went way beyond showbiz. 
Ultimately, Ken Curtis, known for his talents both on the screen and in music, met a heartbreaking end. As the curtains closed on his final act, fans remembered him fondly for his unforgettable role as Festus Hagen in the classic television series Gunsmoke. But his passing left a void that echoed with sadness and loss across the entertainment world. The actor's passing in 1991 hit hard. Fans mourned the loss of a true talent. Reports said he was battling illness, especially a heart problem, in his final days. It was a tough blow for his fans and for the whole entertainment industry. His journey through showbiz, bouncing between acting and singing gigs, left a lasting impression on the entertainment world. Tucked away in the lively streets of Clovis, California, there's a special spot that pays homage to the one and only Ken Curtis. Right there on 430 Pulaski Avenue, you'll find a stunning statue immortalizing him as the beloved character Festus. It's a real head-turner, standing proud in front of the Educational Employees Credit Union. And Clovis wasn't just a place Ken passed through, it was his home sweet home during his later years. A place where he felt the love of the community. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.